Welcome back. We're just going to get uh, started. Uh, last class, I went short of time to demonstrate and talk about deployment. Right, that's the the last step of your project. If you if you work on a supervised uh, modeling project, then you need to use the model, whatever is the best model that you selected, and score the new set of data and then be able to export the scored data set um, <clears throat> and sort of based on which you you know can implement the business uh, decisions so so I'm gonna talk about that and, and basically demo uh, the ways of doing that and uh, you know several alternatives that you can use to export the data set um, and after this after this, I'm going to, to talk about exam one and to give you some feedback. And because, you know, privacy is important, I don't want you to, you know, other people to be able to see your feedback. And uh, so I, I use the Google Forms to sort of use you know, individual password. I, hopefully you see the password. It's in the feedback to your exam one. You can get the password. It's a string of six to eight numbers. You will use that to by, go through a security point to get your the link that that will get you access to your um, submissions with feedback. So that's the process. We'll do that probably in half an hour or so. After that, I'll talk about clustering, the new the new chapter, um, the new the the first the first algorithm under unsupervised models, which is going to be exciting because. Change of gears, you know we're done with the supervised models, almost after deployment. Um, homework seven is due tomorrow, right? Any questions before I start? All right, go ahead and open uh, SAS Enterprise Miner. So deployment, as I said. You, know, you you will use a new node which is called score score node and you also need a new data set which is the score data set um, and for now we don't have any you know uh, practice score data set so you will simply create a copy from the the train data set and pretend it's a score data set you know we can go through the steps still even though the data set is not really a score data set but the steps will be the same. Hey, Dana. Uh, we have just started. Okay, so that's all the information we need from the slides. Was I will simply, you know, start my project, assuming that you know, I have I have had a a bunch of models. So I'm happy with the results. I'm happy with the the best model that comes out of this model comparison. And this is a, a predicting donation donor uh, example. So, uh, you know, have your project ready. I'll go ahead and demo the steps. The first thing that you will need is to import the new data source. So you need to create a, a fake one. So what I did is I used a PVA97. I create a copy, and you know I changed the name. As you see, you know the data set is exactly the same with the same size, but it's just a pretend case. You know, create a, a copy of it, or co create a copy of anything that you worked with. Churn is fine, right? Anything, and rename rename um, the file something about score you know I'm saying fake score here to you know let me see it but you cannot make the name too long because SAS will mask the file if you have the file name too long
So I have already done it before. I'll delete it. I'll do it again. So let me know once you have created a fake score data set and once you're here. It's almost the same process with creating any data source. Question? So what did you just do once you copied and created a new, like a fake score? Right, and rename it to make sure it's short enough, the, the name, and I went to new data source. Raise your hand if you're ready. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, we'll wait. No, we'll wait a little bit. We make a yeah. copy of the data source. Yeah, data, data set. Data Yeah. Anything's going well? Yeah. Okay. Okay, hopefully you have it ready. I'll, I'll go to the next steps. So uh, the same process as uh, looking for the data source, data file, in your library, you should be able to find the fake data set. Confirm and go to the next step. Confirm the, you know, the metadata. And for here, <clears throat> the next two steps are quite critical because uh, it may have un un unintended consequences that later is hard to fix or you might have to start over, all, all over. Uh, for here, uh, hopefully you have remembered what you did for the training data set, right? Uh, select, selecting, select the menus hopefully exactly in the same way that you did for the train. So I think lesson from, from this part is that whenever you do the training, when, whenever you start the project, you, you know, carefully document what you did on these steps, uh, especially in the import process. You know, make sure you document well um, what you did, and then you are able to create an identical setting for the variables and for, you know, mo mostly for the two parts, the, the rows of the inputs, the rows of the variables, you know, import, I, uh, input ID or target or other things, and uh, the row of each uh, variable, the, the level of each variable, you know, nominal, um, interval, binary, or anything else. <coughs> So I think uh, for here, this is the meta data is the, the guiding process. Uh, this is fine, but in this part, in this part, you want to make sure that you have the same setting for the variable that you had in the training set. You can go back to the training set and make sure you have the same thing, right? Just double make sure things are right. For here, the first thing I would change is to reject the target D. Because you can only have one, one target, and target B is actually the target that we use for the training. ID is ID, 
I don't think we rejected anything else. And the variable levels, mostly interval, gender is nominal, cluster is nominal, <coughs> homeowner is nominal, <coughs> ID, that's fine. And the status category, five nominal variables, including the ID. And the target, I think the target should be binary. Yeah. So these are not uh, stated in the tutorial, but if you don't do these in the same way that you did uh, for the training set, you, you're going to have problems because, you know, the score will not run or give you an error, which is not readable, sort of, you know. And so the problems are likely here. Decision process, so do the same thing as you had in the uh, in the project, I think for the most part uh, we didn't do it. So we'll say no. One step back. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'll sort the level to better, you know, better compare. Go to next step and next you wish to create a sample now and here is something that's different you have to choose score in order to score uh, new results but okay something something is going to be different when you actually import the score data set you are not going to have the target because the purpose of score is to score the target values. And you recall that this is fake. So in a fake data set, we, we do have a, you know, score, uh, a target variable. But in real life, or as well as in, in project, you, you will not have the, the target. So you will not specify any target for score data source. And I'm afraid this might not run because I set the score, uh, the target. Uh, it did. Um, okay, so we have the the fake score data source, and I'll drag two things to do the score. I think it's the utility. Something about model. Where is it? Assess. <laughs> there you go. Drag it behind the model comparison. Connect the dots. And drag the, the score data set alongside the model comparison. And also connect the, the, data, so the data source to score. We have two things pointing into the score. So Daniel? The score yeah. Yes, the fake uh, data source. <clears throat> yeah, let me make this bigger so that you can see it. Is that better?
Okay, now you can specify the score node. You would have to run before you go into it to make any changes. Question? I don't mean to ask a lot of questions, but do we need to be fully caught up with you on what you have on your, with all the, because like we, we've done a lot in class, but I know, uh, I think two weeks ago you had added a lot more notes to it. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have all that on ours in order to no, um, those are not even covered in the tutorial. Mm -hmm. um, I can go over them briefly if you want. Um, you don't need to. If I just attach the score to just my model comparison, will that work? Yeah, yeah, it will work. It's just going to get the different results, you know, based on which model is selected. Uh, only the best model that's selected by the model comparison node is going to apply to the new data set, or else will be ignored. So what's the data source that's connected to the model? That's the, f the fake uh, score data source I just created and I just imported it. So you know the process? You need to have a score data set on the yeah. site, right? And then you need to import the, the score data source in the way I just did. And then, you know, in the, up in the upper corner, you will have the additional score data source. Yeah. yeah and then you'll drag over to connect to the score, right? Based on the setting inside the model comparison. The, the For here, yeah, yes. So is this is this the model comparison that you had used at the end of class last uh, last week? Um, the last week we did some changes, right? We did some change with the decisions. We had added like a, we added like a best classified tree. Right, I did. Uh, I didn't include that. They're the, the here. Those two models are here, and that is sort of a, a dead end. Well, not a dead end. That's for demonstration purposes. I didn't include them here, but some of these best trees and best probability trees are here, some of them. Uh, do I have the trees? I may not have the trees. So this model comparison node, sorry. <clears throat> so the model comparison here is not even very complete. It's not, it's, it's by no means a, you know, best practice sort of, you know, sh a demo. Um, it's whatever you know, left to, to this point for demonstration purposes. So in training your models, you would take a systematic approach. You would think about what, you know, different kinds of models you can train. Under each model type, you will try to diversify, you know, the, the models with, with different, uh, you know, settings, parameters, properties, in hoping to generate different, uh, you know, different models. Um, with, with, with different levels of performances. So then you will be able to choose the best of each model type and then choose the best of the best model type in the end. Right. So a lot of drilling down, I think, in the model training process that you will uh, sort of uh, figure out. Um, I, can, I can demonstrate some of the things that I, I did and, you know, how to uh, how to how to improve the neural networks beyond certain point, right? How to improve regressions beyond certain point. What else can you do? Uh, some of the things here 
is 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 what you can do. Although it's not in the tutorial, you know, Lars Lasso. If you're familiar with these, you know, kind of make use of them as additional model training. Um, we will have. I think I will have at least one class is to our discretion, uh, and uh, I don't have anything specific uh, planned. I can talk about those additional advanced uh, modeling tools. So, you know, you can use them in your project. But the first thing is to build the project in a solid, you know, build a, found, build a solid foundation for the project. Make sure the variables are, you know, right. And make sure you understand the variables, uh, fix the problems, um, and, you know, uh, drop um, useless features or filter whatever data that are problematic and cannot be fixed. So those things go first. And modeling is, the, is, is the, the, the last part to try to improve the process. That makes sense? OK, uh, so the score is actually you know, straightforward. It's, you, you don't even have to uh, change any properties. But do you realize how much that is done? here, how much is done in the scoring process. So, well, I had to walk. Um, to get to here, you know, try to recall what you did. You did partition, right, at, at least. Um, you did that. You did some um, imputation, right, did you? You did some binning. You did some replacement and there's some transformations you know, everything that you did is done by the score on the score data set by trying to create the same you know procedure on the score data set without you having to specify because that that's important what if your score data set has a variable that has, has missing values but the missing values are not on the same row as in the train set. What do you do? Right? You need to have a strategy that the model can, you know, impute the missing value in the score. Because if you don't do that, if the model, if, if the if, if the software don't do that, but the variable is being used by the model, you cannot predict with the missing value. Right? So you're saying no no it does it for you it does so that's why it took so long to do it even though everything has been trained you know so that's what happened behind the scenes and don't be surprised if it gives you an error because you know something happened um, something is inconsistent between the two data sources that you would have to fix. I'll talk more about it, but uh, in the scoring process, things could go wrong, but it can still be fixed. It's not something you know, dramatic, but it just means more work maybe to, to, to check the consistency to make sure things are done um, correctly. Okay, once you have scored the, 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 the new data source, and you would have to take the data set out because you want to check, you know, check the results. And um, you can check the results by looking at it without, you know, touching it. Um, you can do that by going to the exported data. So with the score node, uh, you can go to the exported data. So that's what this, um, doing right so now you have a new a new row which says yes right so it's a score data set you can browse explore let's do browse uh, it's essentially the same data set right so the result is not trusted you, sh you shouldn't trust the result but this is for demonstration only
prediction for target B, that is a scored uh, target variable. So I have sorted by uh, prediction for target B, so it's zero first. <clears throat> At some point, it's going to be one. Right? <clears throat> and then recommended, recommended decision for target B. That's the setting in, <clears throat> in the decision uh, decision names, right? We, we said it's either to um, ignore or to, I think, uh, send, send letter. <clears throat> so that's the recommended uh, decisions. All right, so far you have scored the data source, and then you need to get the data set out. There are two ways to do that. You can use SAS code and by using a SAS code node where you can get to program. If you're excited about programming, that's the way to go, you know. Because this is the only part where you, you have to, you can use the programming. <laughs> so one way is to go to utility. I think it's a file with some codes in it. It's a SAS code. Drag it the right of score and connect the all right <clears throat> are we good okay then with the SAS code highlighted you'll go to code editor well before you sorry this is this is awkward. Okay, uh, so you want to make sure that the score code runs uh, successfully. You have a green tick mark at the corner before you implement this, the SAS code. Okay, so this actually runs, but uh, it wants me to kill the other window. That's why you hear the the alarm. So this is the the window that appears after I click here, code editor. Okay, so what you have here is a SAS code editing window. Uh, so let's just type type the codes. It's on page 14. As you type, you will see the color change on the on the uh, word that you type. That means that the keyword of sense. Now, after data and space, you need to use your library name. So whatever your library name is, you need to use it. Dana, you you know how to code sense. Um, so my library is mylib. That you know, I don't know your library name. I mean, you can check it uh, outside out, outside this window. And so after, so once you put a dot, it becomes uh, gray. So that's uh, the gray part is the library name. After the dot, you need to put the name of the new data set that you want to save the results. So give it a name, right? I can say uh, predicted or scored. Scored might be better. And semicolon, new line, indentation, set, and here is a macro code that you will use the same thing as printed on the tutorial. And that's em import score and run. So there is a semicolon at uh, the end of each that, that uh, end of each line. That's a line separator. All right, let me, uh, <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> it's uh, it's hard to see. 
Um, what can I do? You can copy and put it in Word documents. That's a that's a good idea. Yeah. Well, uh, I may lose a color. Um, yeah, but that's better than this. Yeah. Okay, hopefully that's better. So, things that you would have to change from is the 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 part of codes after data. You need to use your own library name. You need to you know, give the name for the exported data, and that's it. We good? Great. Now, uh, you don't have to, s uh, you have to save it. Save it before you exit. And, and then you can run, hopefully, yeah. Well, the first thing I would check is the library scored. So that's it. That's the exported score data set I just had you know, with a date, a time of just now. So that's one way. It's a little bit, you know, a little bit um, involving and, 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 you know, several steps. You have an alternative which is, uh, I think, uh, modify. You have another utility here that you can use, which is similar to building other parts. So this is under utility, it's save data. Now this is in addition to, this is an alternative. This is not a requirement. You can do this as well. And I think you can specify which um, which data set, which library, you know, specify it to, to save the data set in my library, replace existing files, I need to be sure that you don't have anything that's already, already there, um, all observations, all rows, and with this approach, it will save every data set that's available. So with the score, you have the train, and you have validation. You also have the score. I think you will have three new data sets. So under the directory, I will have en save train valid and score, and check the library. And as you can see, I have three new data sets. So you know, either way. Any questions? The objective of saving that is to make it 
is to, I mean, for the course is to is to get the predicted values, and then, you know, you can you can use, e uh, eg to get the the column, and export it to, to to CSV file, and submit it. Um, in in a real scenario, you will use those values to guide the decisions. Right. It's better to have a file than you know, have to go into the EM and, and see it from there. You know, it's better to have the independent file. All right, so that concludes the, um, the entire life cycle of doing the supervised model, right? Once you, if, once you deploy the model and then the project is sort of, it closes the first, uh, the, the, its, its phases. Okay, let me pause the video. Okay, uh, let's continue. So next I will uh, demonstrate SAS uh, implementation of the cluster. We'll use this data set. Um, you can download it from uh, Blackboard, right? It's called Census 2000. It should be in this week's folder, week uh, week 11, I think. Week 11, yeah. Download the Census 2000 data set. Okay. Um, and the tutorial we'll be following will, will be the pattern discovery. Question? Can you just go ahead and put census in uh, EG and like import it and everything? No, you don't have to. That is a SAS data set, so you can use it directly. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you simply put it in the EM folder, right? Okay, you can keep building in the same project, that's fine. Even though it's a different, you know, there's different different uh, model and different data set, that's fine. You can you can use the same library, so it saves the time. So what I will do is to uh, to import the data source. So there's only there are only seven variables. There are, however, a lot of uh, records. It's a long table, and we can use basic here because there, there's not a lot of variables to uh, revise. Okay, from here you can get a sense of what variables are here. We only have seven to play with. And we have an ID which uh, has automatically have a role of ID. It is nominal, of course. Um, you have two, we have two coordinates variable describing the longitude and, and latitude. So sort of the geo information here. Uh, with the geo information, uh, it's not limited to clustering. You can actually 
you know, use sort of the geo information systems uh, tools, which uh, we'll not be talking about. It's it's a same, it's a somewhat similar, uh, different domain you know, from. Uh, it's part of the data analytics, but it's it's quite different from you know unsupervised um, model. We have the oh by the way, each row here is describing a, a household. You know, supposedly this is information collected from census data, uh, and maybe some little bit of uh, you know census data include you. Uh, Household reported information like, you know, um, neighborhoods and house house uh, head count, um, which is recorded here um, as oh, and and based on the the neighborhood that they live with, in you have the information about the neighborhood instead of the individual uh, household here. So you have the mean household size, which is the average head count of a household in the region that they live in. We have the uh, median income, region density, and uh, uh, potentially separating, you know, urban setting from rural settings, and region population size. Okay, so just a few variables. All of them are all of them them are interval variables except the ID, which uh, looks right. So we can go to the next step without changing anything. And no, we're not creating a sample. And we are designating as raw. That's it. Oh, yeah. Uh, which, which step? The rows and levels? No, you, you don't. We, we'll we use the entire data set. And then default percent or rows? Uh, row. Uh, row? No, for oh, rows, so it's wrong. interval. Yeah. It's interval. Is that good? Yeah. Great. So then, and mostly you can, you know, accept the default. And you need a new diagram. For, for a different kind of task. So it's cluster or segment. I think. Segmentation and analysis. Okay, great. I think uh, we're going to do some exploratory data analysis, which uh, will identify some uh, you know, an um, incorrect data set, and then we'll implement a filter node to filter out those uh, records that have problem and diagnose the problems. So, so, and this is one way to do that. You have different ways. You know, as we talked about, you have, uh, you have the replacement node where you, have, you can get a quick um, distribution without generating any distribution in the first place. But here, the approach that's taken is, use, is using the explore function that's built in a lot of the uh, windows. So for a census, before even dragging uh, the node, we will simply look at the <coughs> variables. And I think for all of them, you can control A, select everything, and go to explore.
and whenever I do explore, I, I always remember to change one setting, which is here. I want to make sure if the data set is not too big, I want to make sure I see every data points here. So I want to change the default fetch size to max and apply. So make sure it's not only like a couple thousand, but the entire data set. And that's good. <clears throat> All right. So by looking at these distributions, you can notice a few things. It's getting slow. Well, I don't know why it's happening. OK. It's not refreshing very well. Or maybe I can do that. Yeah, it didn't work. Yeah, it works. Uh, okay. Let's see. So, uh, this variable is odd because it has a uniform distribution. And let's see why it does have uh, that distribution. This is a, a density percentile. Okay, so it, it describes the percentile of the region of the household uh, that the household lives in inside the sample. So then naturally, the, the, the percentile is a uniform distributed thing inside this data set. You, know, you have zero percentile. You have all the way to 100 percentile. Right. So if you rank people in this data set, you have between zero and a hundred, and they are, you know, increasing uniformly. So this variable is not very, um, you know, helpful in terms of looking at the distribution. They have missing values as well, right? They do. You know, these uh, group does not have a, a region density percentile, likely because they don't have the information about density. So if it, if it doesn't have density information, it cannot be ranked and described by percentile. And you see that you know, when I highlight the, this group, a group in the region population close to zero is highlighted. So this, gr this group of records, they probably have a, a problematic uh, values in region population. So that's what we will draw down here. Yeah, uh, we can make a better representation of, or we can better visualize the income here, I think, the every, uh, that, that's a household size. If we increase that, a lot of the uh, data without the percentile shows up here, close to zero. Average household size is smaller than one. What does that mean? A ro uh, so average house size is smaller than one. So we have a house but zero people in, in some of the houses. Right. So uh, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, there, that there's a half a person inside the household. But this is describing the average household size size of the area that these households live in. So there might be discarded houses without any, you know, uh, person living in it, or it may have uh, values that are problematic with zeros in it. So zeros are either problematic or it's not of our interest. You know, we don't, we're not interested in those. So, uh, to, but to, to make sure that we are, you know, zooming into the level of the, the unit of uh, analysis here, uh, you, can, you can change the, the property of the graph to show, you know, greater uh, details of the distribution. So here it's the, the same thing that, that you did with changing the properties of the graphs. We want to increase the number of bins to 100, I think, based on. And once you apply, you have a, 
greater and uh, these values are truly zero and they are separate from the other decimal points the other decimal points might be of interest because the the uh, the area has still has some families in it although there are uh, you know dis deserted um, houses but neighborhoods where no family lives in are not of interest here and uh, other interesting things are that if you highlight that that group with the uh, zero average density uh, no zero family signs and almost entirely the group with the, the missing values in the density percentile is highlighted so these uh, are the, the the rows of data that have uh, much problem so we want to uh, filter them out from the analysis Um, by simply detecting one problem, it's not enough uh, reason to exclude the data. But if you identify multiple problems with the same rows, then that, that's strong evidence to you know, conclude that you know, we can move on without those data points. But one last thing to check is what is the size of that problematic uh, um, you know, data? How much is it? Will it, will it induce uh, you know, uh, will we'll excuse the results if we exclude them. If it's a significant portion, we might want to look into the reasons why they are missing or they are problematic. So exiting here. So I didn't do anything here. I don't have to change. Ha, I don't have to save just to make sure I didn't do anything um, unintended. We uh, drag the data node, and then we will choose the filter, which will be in the modify. No, nope. it's a sample. It's in the sample tab. Okay, uh, once you drag the filter, there are quite a few things to to change here. So uh, the filter node is, I think, it, it, it's trying to be smart by you know having a lot of default settings which will make changes even you know without you realizing and I don't think this is good so the first thing I will do is to disable all the default methods whatever will be enacted on the data set so that you know nothing is done unintentionally unintended so here for the class variable once you highlight the filter the the default filtering method is based on the rare values and you know you can you can you might be able to change what you know how is the, the rarity defined is it you know one point uh, one percent of the entire data set is is rarity or what you have the ability to change that in one of these <coughs> settings but what I will do is disable the default method so that it's not making changes because we don't want to exclude any um, <coughs> any any levels of the nominal variables that are a small a representation of the data set we don't have e don't, we don't even have any nominal variables here so it's fine and for the default filter we will not we will not use the default here for the interval variables the default method is to filter out anything that's beyond certain standard deviation from the mean and you know it's a it's a lazy method to to filter out anything that's extreme the outliers but don't do that without any you know specific your know, clear rationale of you know you know which data which part of the data are outliers uh, if you don't know that don't do don't use the default for here, we're using the user-specific 
So it's going to filter out any values that are specified as beyond the limit here for a specific variable. It's not, you know, automatically applied to every variable. And so then we will be able to, you will be able to individually change the limit here. Once you change the specific user specific, we'll go into the interval variables select uh, edit window and specifically set the limit for the family size. So it's the mean household size. It's a variable name instead of the label. You can get the label here, you know, to be sure that you're making changes to the to the variable that you want. Okay, so it, uh, every everything uses the default. The default means here after the change, after the change, the default means uh, it will filter out those those rows with a value outside the boundary if you don't set a limit it will not filter out anything here we will only put in the limit for this one variable and it's a lower limit instead of um, other than the, the upper limit we only want to exclude those points with a value that's lower than point one on the uh, mean household size So after you put point 0.1, say OK, and it will be saved. And once you run, you can see the report. Push. Look at the results. We have close to 33,000 33, rows and 32,000, some 32,000 were filtered through and 1,000 points were filtered out and excluded and dropped from the data, which is about 3%, which is okay. You know, it's a, it's a small percentage and so we have everything we need. We know every, we, we, we know enough reasons to filter them out. They have multiple problems, right? And it's not a big portion. It's not a significant portion of the train set. So it's okay to move move forward without them. Any questions so far? Now you're ready to put the cluster. Where is it? Model. Explore. Interesting. So it, it's it's under the explore tab. It's uh, you know one use of the cluster is the exploratory data analysis. So you know trying to understand in trying to understand the data set you can use cluster to do some analysis before, even inside a, uh, a supervised model, you know, just to try to understand the, the, the clusters inside the data set. change the variables I think uh, we're not using the entire data set we're not in using the entire list of uh, inputs so to, to change uh, for multiple variables you use uh, control no use control And change use to no, and it's done. And go OK. Are we good?
Everything's good? Great. Well, I'll go, oh, I'll click OK. And uh, what what is one thing that is critical in K nearest neighbor that you, you, you know, you, you can make sure that the distance function is doing the right thing? Exactly. So normalization or standardization, we're talking about the same thing. There are two methods. You can use either. Uh, it has different uh, tastes and different variations, or small variations, but it's not going to be a dramatic difference. So here, uh, it says you know, the standardization option is automatically selected. So for any variable that is uh, interval, it will standardize based on the z-score standardization. And let's see. I'll talk about this CCC. It's a, um, a score that you can use to guide your selection of the uh, of K. You know, uh, in uh, K means this is K means cluster. You have to decide a K as with similar to K nearest neighbor, and it's it, it's both a flexibility and a liability. You have to specify K before. You can go. You can experiment with different things, but it's better to have a guide. And, and this one here is going to provide some information uh, after the analysis. But uh, you can set an upper limit. And there's an option to create the segment. So what this does is based on the, the clustering result, you know, you have different clusters and there's an arbitrary cluster number that can be created. It starts from one, obviously. If you have three, if you set K as three, you have three clusters as a result, then uh, the, the algorithm will create one more column to the data and designate the cluster number. You know, uh, you can make some use of it. You can you can use it to guide your next stage um, analysis by knowing the the result of the cluster. You can treat it as one input variable, right? So, if you if you choose input here, uh, SAS will designate the row as input as you know the the new column of cluster number as uh, input, and then you can use it as input in the next stage. Or you can designate as target, and you know use that as a target to guide uh, another endeavor. I think another data analysis as a supervised, and, and try to look for informative inputs. I guess probably. So, or you can use it as ID. I don't know how you can make use of it, but it's an option. Here, uh, using segment helps you create uh, profile information by using one of the other nodes here. So we'll keep the default uh, default row as segment here. Question? Did you end up changing the CCC cutoff? No, I didn't change. Yeah, keep the default.
So here, uh, we allow the algorithm to select the best choice of k, um, to select the best number of clusters. And we allow the algorithm to choose minimal 2 and maximal 50. We use The algorithm will use CCC as guidance to choose. But how does it do it? The result is a, f a, th a four cluster solution here <coughs> where you have the segment ID as one of the you know created columns uh, with every row you know and then so the row will have a cluster ID either one or two or three or four and you can see the sides of the different clusters they are they differ by a lot And then let's take a look at the CCC plot. View summary statistics. Okay. So this one is a little bit of ugly. can change the sides to something smaller and can see more clearly the differences. Okay, so here the CCC is at negative something. It's very small. Uh, number of cluster is four. So the X axis is an increasing number of um, number of clusters, which is the K. And the height is the CCC. Typically, if it's not extreme, if it's not too or very large, then you know, the guidance for selecting K is to look for a local, um, a local sort of a peak. You know, here there's a local peak, and then before it drops and then goes, goes up again and to, to a lot bigger. So that's how the program selects that. Um, there's a there's a whole you know group of theories behind why this is the best, but uh, we're not going to the details here. We just trust the program, but we would try to read the results based on whatever K is selected. Any questions? Okay, so. We have the clusters, we know the size of it. We saw the pie chart. Um, but how to understand the different clusters? You know, there's, a, there's a tool here that can help. So after, you can specify the, your own cluster number if you want, instead of using the CCC. <coughs> I think there's a cluster profile. Segment profile. And and this is part of the homework, I think. So the homework in homework you will segment the the, um, the customer of the telecommunication company and then you will create profiles for the different clusters of you know their behaviors And in the uh, segment profile, you also have to exclude certain variables that are, that are not used in s clustering, but designate a role for the segment.
Sigmund label is rejected. Sigmund. For the cluster? Um, yeah, like the two the second and second Oh, uh, the label is rejected by the system automatically. Uh, we will use the segment. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we, we only rejected the four variables. So this cluster, this segment profile is pretty neat. Uh, based on the segmentation results, based on the new segment, um, you know, the, the label, it's, it's going to show summary statistics uh, as well as distributions of each cluster against the entire data set. So you can see the difference of a particular cluster as compared to the, the background. You know, how does it do it? It will use hollow bars for the entire data set, but it will use colors for, this, for, for, the, for the FOCO uh, cluster. Um, here it's, it's an, uh, the same pie chart as previously you've seen. This is variable worth, which is you know, the, the, the significance or the, um, the correlation between the variable with the cluster label. Yes. Thinking of cluster label as a target variable, it, it's sort of a, a nominal variable, right? So you can calculate the how much contribution each variable made to the, the clustering result. And region density is the one that uh, makes the, the most uh, difference here. Followed by household income, median household income region, and uh, median house site, household site. So what we're uh, looking at really for the profile or this, uh, uh, you know, big uh, chart with a lot of subplots. Um, so it's going to have sort of a matrix plot layout and you have the same number of rows of, of plots as the number of K. Here we have the K equal four. We have four clusters. So we have four clusters, four rows of uh, uh, <coughs> graphs, and if you if you f you know if you pay attention to the hollow bars, they are mostly the same uh, across the different clusters, but uh, sometimes on the different height because the scale is slightly off for the specific cluster. You know some of the clusters are pretty unique compared to the entire uh, population. But their overall distribution, the shape of the distribution is going to be uh, the same. But the order of appearance of the different variables for each cluster also changes. So that makes the graph uh, you know, more difficult to read if you have a lot of variables and a lot of clusters. Right? So you know, to the extreme, suppose you have a thousand clusters, even though you know, you have a, a, a million, uh, you know, sides of data set. Having a thousand is a small number still, comparatively. But it's, it's not going to be easy to read a thousand profiles. And it, it's, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't reduce the effort, uh, the cost of uh, trying to understand the population. So, you know, you typically don't have more than 20 or 25 clusters. And you know, by looking at this, this is a dramatic uh, difference. Cluster two occupy the lower half of the uh, region density percentile. So these are mostly the uh, rural areas, I think. And cluster three are mostly the uh, urban setting. So you can make the difference here. Um, on three of the clusters, you have three variables that end their distributions. But on cluster four, you only have one graph. Uh, 
probably because that cluster is pretty small as compared to the others. So based on the comparisons and differences, you can make profiles, which I'll talk about in the slides. So that this concludes the uh, demonstration of the cluster tool and the, and the segmentation profile.